Our series is called, what? Faithful. And we have been studying, uh, hopefully with some clarity, the faithfulness of God. And so uh, faithfulness, of course, being the consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. And I had mentioned to you before, and it's worth mentioning again, that if we are to move forward with confidence, we need to look back and see consistency. And if we have uh, looked back in our rearview mirror and seen God consistently be reliable time and time again, then we can look forward with some confidence. And we all need confidence, and I hope that your confidence is building. And the more time and the more consistency, the more confidence. And so hopefully you're trusting God more. That's, that's a, it's a twofold objective here. There's a reason for this series, and it's for these two reasons that we preach these words. And one, we want to learn to trust God more. And so uh, we can look back, like I said, on our history and on the history of God and His people and see a consistent pattern of reliability on His behalf, and we can learn to trust Him in more areas of our life. And then in those areas that we've already said, yes, Lord, we trust You, but we don't trust You enough. Hopefully we can trust Him at greater levels as time goes on. And then the second thing is that hopefully others can begin to trust us more so that we become more faithful, just like God is faithful because that's who God is, that's who we should be. And we've let people down over the years and we don't want to be that person. And so remember, this is the reliability displayed over time, not just this week or this month. We're talking about something that is lasting if someone has been reliable over time, we can bank on them. We can count on them. And so to look at the reliability of God, we wanted to go back on the long timeline. We want to go way, way back, and then we want to come all the way straight through right to the present. And in the weeks to come, I'm going to be asking you to share your story and how God has been faithful in your life because that is going to encourage the people in your church. And so have the guts to get up when your preacher asks you to do so. We all have a story. I know a lot of us have great stories. We can look back and see what he's done. And we need to learn those things because the Bible tells us, and it's so very true, that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. So what Jesus did for us, of course, that's number one. And on the word of your testimony. What, have, what has God done in your life? And you can encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's coming. But first we went way, way back to Abraham. And we studied about how God made some promises to Abraham, how he was going to be the father of nation. And if you think about a nation, that means it's got to have a king, that means it's got to have land, it's got to have people. And we see now, all these years later, that the nation is here, and you're part of it. And so, look, there's two and a half billion of us across the earth, not to mention all those that have been Christians way before we ever lived. So how many billion there was? And we have a king, and his name is Jesus. And his kingdom is spread across the entire earth. So his promise came to pass, and so we can bank on him. And then we jumped 640 years, just going down the timeline, right? We jumped 640 years, and we studied a little bit about Moses. Now, if you remember from last week, the story of Moses actually starts with Abraham back in Genesis 12. When Abraham and God were having this talk about these promises, God said to Abraham, hey, listen, you can be sure of this. Your descendants will be in a foreign land for 400 years, and they're going to be slaves. And I'm going to set them free, and they're going to be wealthy when they leave, and I'm going to punish the ones who held them in slavery. And hundreds of years later, guess what happens? Exactly what he said would happen, happened. Now remember this. He's working with a king who's not willing to give in. He wasn't a cooperative king. This was the Pharaoh who thought he was God. But somehow God, it says that God caused the Egyptians to look generously upon Israel. The people that they hated, their slaves, all of a sudden they start giving them all their silver and gold because God caused them to do it. God can intervene. He would ask you to give in, but if you don't, sometimes he'll cause you to do some things. And it's easier to give in than to have the hand of God upon you. Maybe that's just your lesson today and that's it. Drop the mic, but... He causes some things to happen. And so exactly what he predicted is exactly what happened. They went from slaves and broke and poor and poverty and whipped and beaten and oppressed for 400 years to leaving Egypt with silver and gold. It says that they stripped Egypt of all of its wealth. 
So exactly what he said would happen has happened. Now, this morning I want to jump not 640 years, I want to jump 900 years. And I would invite you to open up your Bible. Please open your Bible to the book of Esther. Now, I've never, in all the years of preaching, I've never preached from the book of Esther. I may have mentioned it in passing. It's a tremendous book of the Bible. You know, it's funny. It's the only book of the Bible that never mentions God. Never mentions God, never mentions Lord, nothing, ever. But God is very much in it and very much the author of it. So we turn to the book of Esther, and the claim of God is that I am the Lord and I do not change. And Jesus Christ, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we want to see if that's the actual case or if it's just a claim that has no, um, no credibility. We want to trust him more. We want to lean on him more. We want to rely on him more. Is he consistently this God who makes promises and delivers? We don't know yet. We're trying to establish that. So... As you're turning to the book of Esther, and I think the page number should be on the screen in one of these Bibles here. Um, if you have your own, that's awesome. If you have one on a phone, that's cool too. As you're turning there, I want to just say that we're going to be talking a little bit about <clears throat> the Medo-Persian Empire, but um, that's the context of the book of Esther. There's some, been some world empires that have come and gone over the years. Many of them you've heard of, maybe you haven't. The Assyrian Empire the Babylonian Empire, that was a famous one. This one that we're going to talk about today, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, the Roman Empire, of course, you've all heard of that. But the context of the book of Esther is in the Medo-Persian Empire. You can see up on the screen, there are the borders of the Medo-Persian Empire. It was a huge, huge empire, and it is believed that 44% of the world's population lived within the boundaries of the Persian Empire. It was a humongous empire, and it, was, it had several kings, but towards the beginning, but not quite at the beginning, from uh, this, this empire, I'm sorry, this empire lasted from 550 B.C. to 330 B.C., and that, just to give you some context, um, that's about how long America's been in existence right now. Uh, it was about 220 years. And so that's, that's, that was the Medo-Persian Empire. Mighty empire, tons of soldiers, brutal people. Just go in, take over, hostile takeover, just kill and slay. Uh, and in, in the middle of that, from the years 486 to 465, there was a king. His name was Xerxes. There will this be guy. no glory in your sacrifice. I will erase even the memory of Sparta from the histories. Every piece of Greek parchment shall be burned. Every Greek historian... And every scribe shall have their eyes put out and their tongues cut for their mouths. Why, honoring the very name of Sparta or Leonidas will be punishable by death. The world will never know you existed at all. Nice guy. Um, not quite sure how accurate that movie, that, that's the movie 300. Maybe you guys have seen it, maybe you haven't. It's brutal. Uh, but again, I don't know how accurate that is. That's the Hollywood version of King Xerxes. Not a super nice guy at all. Let me give you the biblical Xerxes. Um, let me give you this also. When I was growing up in temple as a Jewish kid, he wasn't known as Xerxes. The Hebrew was Achashverosh. I don't even know if you can say that unless you get the Jewish going. But it's Achashverosh, but King Xerxes. This is the biblical interaction. This is the biblical example of who he is. Um, he's going to cut out tongues and he's going to pluck out eyes and, and wipe you off from existence and you won't even think about this person ever. He's, he's a mean guy, but here's what it says in the Bible about this King Xerxes, just so you can understand who it is that's leading this empire. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 11, it says, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before this king in his inner court, without being invited, is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. If you walk into his presence, he thought he was a god. If you walked into his presence uninvited and he didn't hold out his scepter, in other words, it's okay for you to be here. If, you, if he didn't do that, you're dead. You're just dead. That's it. That's who this guy is. Super, super nice guy. And that's who the king was during the time of Esther. And so uh, in the third year of his reign, 
Uh, this is when all this is going down. You're going to see here at the beginning of the book, I'm going to read a little bit to you here in the first chapter. You're going to see that his queen, Vashti, doesn't obey one of his orders, and she is now banished from the kingdom. This is who this guy is. So just to kind of read a little bit with you, just to get the proper understanding of what's going on, because context is important to the story. Uh, I'm going to read in chapter 1, I'm going to read uh, verses 10 through 18, just kind of skim through it. The, and, and what's leading up to that is that the king, he's, he's, had this, he's having a huge celebration. It lasted 180 days, and it was to display his opulent wealth and pomp and splendor and majesty of who King Xerxes was. And then he threw another party within his palace, not for everybody, just the people in the palace. And it says in verse 10, on the seventh day of that feast, of that celebration, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine. Okay, do you all understand that he's hammered drunk, right? That, this is what's going on. So let me just say that you're, what you're about to, to read, you're going to know that nothing good ever happens from drinking. So drinking is stupid. I understand if you want to have a glass of wine with dinner, but no good thing ever happens when we're drunk. Okay, so wa watch what happens here. So King Xerxes is, this is the Bible's way of saying he is wasted. He is in high spirits because of the wine, and he told the seven eunuchs, let me just tell you what a eunuch is in case you don't know. These were, like back then, if you were going to become king, you'd kill the king that's there now. That's how you'd get to be king. I don't like you, I want to be king, I kill you, and I take your spot, right? So to protect himself, the king would take men and castrate them so that their desire to be um, tough guys and overthrow and do something aggressive is no longer there. Like a horse, they would, a horse is gelded and it takes their spirit away, so they're kind of calm. And so that's what a eunuch would be, he's a man who's castrated so he wouldn't pose a threat to the king. You know, the king's sleeping. You don't want someone in the room who can come in and slice your throat, because that's what they do back then. You know, now we just vote someone out. Back then, they kill a guy, right? So, so he's got these eunuchs. He's, he's drunk, and he goes to these seven eunuchs who attended him, and he tells them to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. Now, this is crazy. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. Like, that's crazy, right? Like, I have a beautiful wife, but I don't want to parade her in front of other men so that they could be checking her out. Like, that's kind of crazy, but this is the kind of stupid choices that people make when they're drunk, right? So this is what's going on. So, so when, the, when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come, and this made the king furious, and he burned with anger. Again, drunk, okay? He, how many people do stupid things when they're drunk, right? Me, all of us, right? So he's burning with anger. He immediately, right, upon, right then, not, not, not the next week or the next day, he immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. And then it goes through the names that doesn't matter what their names are. Seven nobles of Persia and Media, they met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. These are the ones who knew the rules of the empire. And so the king says this, what must be done to Queen Vashti? The king demanded. What penalty, he's very specific, what penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs. So the impl the, the, what's implied here is that there's actually a law that specifically covers this issue. Kind of weird. So this guy, Memucan, he answers the king and his nobles. He says, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. And he's like freaking out, panicking, like, oh, the women are in an uproar, right? It's a revolt. Before this day is out, you can see the panic in their voice, right? Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. They're not going to listen to him anymore. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. Just insanity, right? <laughs> so if it... 
I mean, it's just, these are supposed to be tough guys, right? Oh, my wife's not going to listen to me anymore. What are we going to do? Oh, it's crazy. So, so he says this. So, so listen, he asked the law guys, what's the law? And, and the guys don't answer with the law. He's giving an opinion here. If it was a law, he'd say, this is what the law says. This is what we do. But he doesn't say that. He says, this is the problem. She didn't just offend you. She's messing with me now. My house is going to be a mess, and I don't know what to do. So if it pleased the king, it's not the law, but if it pleases the king, we suggest, this is not law, this is a suggestion, this is an opinion, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. Now that's kind of weird. Now in a moment you're going to see what made her, this next queen, to be more worthy. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. The ladies, you all should be laughing right now. The king... <laughs> The king and his nobles thought this made good sense. Of course they did. They're all drunk. Morons. Okay, so the king and his nobles thought this made good sense, so he followed Memucan's counsel. He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. Awesome story. So he asks the guys who know all the rules for advice. Can I just say that the guy or the gal that knows all the rules isn't always the wisest guy or gal? You know, one of Jesus' main ministries, if you study the life of him in Scripture, you know one of his main ministries was? To bring low the know-it-all. The one who thought he knew all the rules and all the regulations, Jesus would bring him down and humble that person who thought he knew it all. In Luke 16, Jesus says, you like to appear righteous. He's talking to the ones who knew all the laws. You, you, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. See, that was the problem with the rule knower. The one who knows all the rules, but he doesn't understand the heart behind the rule. Why, the, 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 why God gave them the rule. He says, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your heart. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Several times in Scripture, God would have a, a word to say about the rule knowers, the ones who thought they knew it all. He called them hypocrites. He called them sons of the devil. He called them whitewashed tombs. He said when it came to the law, they, they, they seemed to want to pick apart and, and point out every little piece of the law. you got to do this and you got to do that. So he described it this way. You strain the liquid, your drink, so that you strain out the littlest gnat, but you swallow a camel. You have no idea of the heart behind the law. You try to keep every little nook and cranny of it, but you know nothing of the law and the heart behind it. In Luke 13, Jesus was in church on the Sabbath day, and a crippled lady walks in, and he heals her. And the head rule knower, the know-it-all, he gets up, he's ob he objects to the whole thing. He says, listen, there's six other days of the week that you can do work, but you can't be doing this work of, this, of healing on the Sabbath day. That's wrong. See, they acknowledge the healing power of God. It's not that they don't understand that God is real and that he can heal, but they don't have a clue of the heart of God. See, Jesus says she's been crippled by Satan for 18 years. She's been bound up and crippled and bent over by Satan. So isn't it right that she would be healed? Wouldn't she, isn't it right that she should be healed on God's day that he created? Isn't it a good day to do his work? See, see he was trying to give her rest. They were saying, you've got you to rest on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, you guys don't get it. I'm trying to give her rest. She's been crippled by Satan for 18 years, and I'm trying to break her free from that so she can have rest. She was tr he was trying to give her rest, and the rest experts missed it completely. And that's what he tries to do for us. 
See, the guy or the girl that knows all the rules isn't always the wisest guy or girl. The guy who knows the rules and knows the rule maker and allows the rule maker to lead him or her in how and when to implement such rules, that's a wise person. And so we have to be careful who we hang out with. If you look at this story about Xerxes, he always asked them. And we need to be careful who we hang out with. The scriptures say that bad company corrupts good character. We can't be hanging out with rule people all the time. You have to do this and you can never do that. And they speak in absolutes all the time. Always, never. That's what Xerxes did. He always asked these people's advice. And the rules guys, listen, they may have been experts in the rule, but they offered an opinion. And the people who have these big college degrees and all these letters behind their name, they seem, everyone thinks they're the wise people. But when they give their opinion, they're not an expert. Stick to the, expert, to the field you're an expert in. Don't be giving out advice on things that you know nothing of. And Xerxes always asked their advice. He never sought advice from anyone else. He always went there. But see, that's not who we should always go to. The Bible says we should seek godly counsel. What is someone who is godly? Someone who knows all the rules? Well, Jesus Christ is the perfect example. In John 1.14, it says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. See, he understood the truth of the rules. We also understood the heart behind them. And so, since Christ's followers follow Christ, then we can't be only like laws and no love. Right? It was like Paul... He, he, he knew all the, 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 the rules, right? And he said, if I, if I gave up everything for the poor and I could speak in, in, the, in, the, in the tongues of angels, and he kept all the rules. He's like, but if I have all that, but I have, if I have, don't have love, I have nothing. You can't be all rules and no love. And at the same time, we can't be all love with no limit. Now, I understand we're supposed to forgive people a million times over and we're supposed to love every single person. But don't let this love become lovey-dovey that allows everyone to do everything and that it's okay. God has some limits. He's like, listen, I love you, right? You all know that God loves you? Yes. Do you all understand that no matter what you do, he loves you? Yes. But he also says, hey, listen, I love you so much. Quit doing that. It hurts you. And it offends me. Don't do it. So we can't just let be a church filled with people of love and love and love and you can do whatever you want and there's no limits and just it's okay and God's grace and listen don't we can't be we can't be laws and no love cuz that's a hammer that's abrupt and harsh and no one wants to listen to you but you can't be love with no limit that just lets everything go and it's okay and so since the word tells us to seek godly counsel and Jesus' grace and truth both fully, then our advisors, the people we go to for advice, should be the same. Not just the people who know all the rules. Listen, God, in the person of Jesus, his, one of his favorite things to do, like I said, is to bring down low the ones who know it all. But the real know-it-all, the real know-it-all knows that they don't know it all. And they walk humbly before the Lord. You see, King Solomon was the king of Israel. But when, he was at, when God said, hey, what do you want? What was the one thing he asked for? I need wisdom to lead your people. He was the king, but yet he still understood, I, I need to be humble before God. I cannot do what you've asked me to do without your help. I need your wisdom. Paul said that he knew and kept the rules, not good or great, but perfectly. But he said, that means nothing. I consider all of that worthless compared to knowing the rule giver. He knew the rules, but it meant nothing compared to having a relationship with God. And so God's people should always walk in humility and seek to be grace and truth people. So, going back to the story, Vashti is out, and Esther is now in as queen. Now, I told you a moment ago, we're going to talk about how they chose someone to be worthy. Vashti is disobedient to the king, so she's unworthy of being a queen. That disqualifies her from being queen. But this drunk moron, he, this is how these people are going to decide who is worthy of being a queen. Now, you may have your ideas of what makes someone worthy of being queen. Maybe they were, they were born into that family, so maybe blood, right? 
Maybe someone of noble character and elegance and grace and beauty and wisdom. That would qualify you as queen. But not in this culture. In this situation, what happens is, King Xerxes is king and emperor and ruler and their god over this massive area. With 44%, nearly half of the world's population under his thumb. He's control. So it said that in this whole area, it was divided up into 127 provinces. So his wise men, these morons who thought they were experts, said, here's a great idea. Let's go out and throw out your whole kingdom and let's round up of all the 127 provinces, let's round up all these young virgins. Now, when you talk about young virgins, I don't know exactly how old they were. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, I don't know. All these young virgins that have not been married yet, and they haven't been with a man, let's round them all up. This could be hundreds. This could be thousands of girls taken against their own free will and captured and brought to the palace to be put in a harem, it says, and they'll stay in there and, every, and they'll get beauty treatment. So we'll rub lotions and ointments all over them so their skin is soft and we'll give them the right diet so their figures are just right and we'll do their hair and put their makeup on and make them beautiful and one by one we'll bring them into the palace so that they can sleep with Xerxes. And whichever one he likes the best that's going to be the queen. This is like the bachelor Persian Empire style. It's sick. Just think about this. Think about that's the, that. And so listen, of all these women that are brought into the palace, he sleeps with all of them, and he decides at the end, this one's the one I like the most. This is the one I look at and see her to be the most beautiful, and she's the most um, fulfilling in the bedroom, and all this. This is the one I like put a crown on her head. And so now she is the queen. Crazy. You think that this country is bad and you think that this country is going to hell in a handbasket and it's Jesus is about to come because it couldn't get any worse? Come on now. <laughs> Give a little credit to America. This is pretty bad right here. But this is what's going on. Now, some more to the story. Esther, her parents had died. And so her cousin, Mordecai, was a good man, and he took her into his house before this all went down, and he was raising her from a small child and taking good care of her and raising her like she was his own. And God is going to use Mordecai to display his faithfulness. Now remember, God is never mentioned in this book, but you're going to see his hand on things in a big way. And he uses Mordecai. Check out Mordecai. Here's, here's what happens um, let, let me just talk a little bit about Mordecai here. I want you to see a little bit about him. We're just going to call him Morty. Look in um, Esther chapter 2. Look in verse 21. Here's a little story about Mordecai, just to give you an idea of who he is. We can learn a little something from him, big time, right here. So, remember now, King Xerxes has ordered all these girls to be taken from their families, no questions asked. If you deny him, what happens? You die. And he's gone forth and he's grabbed all these hundreds, if not thousands, of young virgin girls from their families against their will. He's put them into a harem. He's sleeping with them one by one. He's oppressing the people of Israel. He's the evil dictator that is overlord of all these people. And look what happens. One day, as Mordecai, the Jew was on duty at his job at the king's gate. Two of the king's eunuchs, Biggie and Terry, we'll just call them Biggie and Terry. Now, they were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, so they had access that most people did not. And they became angry at King Xerxes. I don't know what it was, but they were angry, and they plotted to assassinate him. These are guys that King Xerxes had neutered and castrated, and they weren't going to be of any threat, but somehow he ticked them off really, really bad, and so they were going to plan to have him killed, kill him himself or have someone kill him, but I don't know who it was, what it was. But it says that Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. 
She then went to the king. That was risky, right? And she told the king about it and gave Mordecai the credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men who were going to assassinate him were impaled on a sharpened pole. Yikes. So, so his cousin that he loved is part of the Bachelor Persian Empire edition. Xerxes is this drunk, sexually corrupt, power-hungry, egotistical deity problem. He thought he was God. He's this king who's, who's oppressing the Jews, and he has taken all these girls, including Esther, against their will, right? And so Mordecai probably doesn't like him very much, but these two of, of, of King Xerxes' closest people, like his two top secret service agents, if you will, they're planning to kill him, and so Mordecai, how Mordecai responds, it teaches us a very valuable lesson here in 2018 America. And that is this, that even when we're surrounded, as Christians, we are surrounded by craziness and corruption, God's people should always display character. Always. Always. So you think Morty liked this guy? I mean, just think about what happened here, right? He, he took this little girl whom he loved and was raising as his own and the soldiers come and they take this little girl against her will, this little 12, 13, 14, 15 year old little girl, take, rip her out of the home, bring her to the castle against her will and have her sleep with the king and Mordecai who's a Jew, he is part of a, of a race that is being oppressed by King Xerxes, this evil psycho. So do you think he liked them? Probably not, but he still did the right thing. He still did the right thing. And as a result of him doing the right thing, the result of his good character, if you read on in the story, in chapter 8, verse 15, it says that King Xerxes put a crown on his head because of his character. Now, why does that help us here now? I don't know who you voted for as president, you may have loved Donald Trump and voted for him. You may hate him and vote against him. But let me tell you something, and it, makes, it breaks my heart. And I hope it breaks yours too. 75% of this country claims to be Christ followers. And in these last couple years, I have never seen more disgusting hate and slander thrown at a, at a, at a, a person of authority. It's nauseating. It's nauseating. Online, social media, on the news, sh I don't, it doesn't make any difference who he is or what his character is. We are Christians, and it doesn't matter who is in office. Let me tell you something. According to the Bible, you didn't elect him. According to the Bible, it says that God appoints all people in authority. You didn't do it. He used you to accomplish his purposes. And when God puts someone in office, how dare us rip and slander this person down. It doesn't make any difference if you don't like him. If you don't like him, don't vote for him next time. But for us to get online and social media and the news and everything and rip this guy to shreds and tell how awful he is, listen, that is not the mandate of God's word. God's word says in Romans 13 that we're to submit to governing authority to give respect and honor to those who are in authority. In 1 Timothy 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says to pray for kings and all who are in authority. Not get online and say how rotten and disgusting and despicable and make fun and put nasty cartoons and awful things. No, God's word says something different to you. What he's saying is it doesn't make any difference what you think or how you feel if you're a Christ follower, then you do as the Word of God says. You submit, you give respect, and honor, and pray for that man. That's the only thing that you should be doing. Ever. That's what God says for you to do. So, let's move on in the story. Haman is ticked. Haman is now the lead official for King Xerxes. He's been appointed, his, his, let's just call it like his secretary of state or his vice president or something like that, like the next guy in charge, the, the head of the nobles. And when he comes in town, 
this, this Jewish guy, Mordecai, remember I said he's got, he displayed character, right? That's what godly people do. They display good character no matter what the situation is. They display good character. And so when Haman walks through town, everyone bows to him. But Mordecai chooses not to. Why? Because he's a man of character. Because what he says he is, he actually is. Right? He doesn't just say he's one thing but acts another, which is what a lot of us do. No, Mordecai is actually a man of character. What he says he is, he's going to do. And see, so the reason why he doesn't bow is because in the first two commandments that, that rule over Mordecai's life, the first of the, two, of the Ten Commandments, it says, number one, there's only one God. That's it. It's me. I'm God. And the second one is don't bow to any other. And so it makes sense because Mordecai is a man of character that when Haman comes walking through town, he's not going to bow to him. And that ticks, Morde that ticks Haman off big time. So in chapter 3, Haman convinces King Xerxes that all the Jews in the kingdom should die. He's so mad at this one guy for not bowing to him. He's like, no, I don't want to just kill him. I want to kill everyone that's part of his nation. Now remember some. This is super, super huge, huge important, right? Oh, you know what? Before I tell you about <laughs> when I was a kid, I went to temple and we celebrated this holiday. The holiday that, that's wrapped around this story is called Purim. Purim is just another word for lots that cast lots. You'll see it in the, in the story if you choose to read the book of Esther. You'll see it. But this is, what, this is how I used to celebrate it in temple. This is so cool. It was the story of the good guys against the bad guys. The Jews, of course, were the good guys, and Haman and his guys were the bad guys. And so what we would do is we'd go into the temple, and they would hand out noisemakers to all the kids. And then they'd give you a pen. And you'd sit down, and you'd write Haman on the bottom of your shoes. And every time the rabbi was teaching through the story, every time that he mentioned the name Haman, the kids would go and step on his name because he's bad. And every time it seems that the Jewish people were victor victorious, you'd go like this and celebrate. See, I just thought it was the story of good guys against bad guys, and the good guys prevail. Now, that's awesome in Hollywood, but that's not the story of Esther. The story of Esther is perfect for our series called Faithful. This story right here absolutely displays the faithfulness of God. Now, listen, this is why. Haman said, I want to kill every single Jew in your kingdom. Now remember, nearly half the world's population lives within the boundaries of this kingdom. And so if Haman actually gets to his plan and, and executes it, you can see that it's the, now the end of the Jewish people. They all live within the kingdom, within the empire of the Pedo Persian, a Pedo, Me, <laughs> Persian Medo, em, Medo Persian Empire. So the story of Esther is actually the story of God's faithfulness, yet God is never mentioned. But here's the thing, that God had made a promise to Abraham 1,600 years before that he would create a nation. And God is unwilling to deny himself, and he refuses to let his reputation be tarnished. So if the promise, if, if Haman wins and gets his way, then the promise to Abraham is dead, right? And God is unwilling to let that happen. So, so check out the confidence displayed in Mordecai. See, he's a man, he's a, he's a Jewish guy. He knows the promise that God had made to Abraham 1,600 years ago. And so he comes forth in confidence when he goes to Esther and says, listen, Haman's got this thing, this edict, and, and I want you to go to King Xerxes and tell him about it, and ask him for help. Well, all the while, Esther's like, well, I can't just go before the king, because if I go before the king and he didn't invite me, I'm going to die. And so Mordecai goes up to her and he says, listen, Esther, chapter 4, verse 14, 14, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will come from another place. Mordecai knows that if Esther doesn't step forward and say something and bring help to the Jewish people, somehow, some way, it's going to come. Because God had made a promise to Abraham, and it will it'll always come to pass. Much like Abraham and Isaac on the mountain. When Abraham goes to kill his own son, he's the one who received the promise from God that there would be a nation through that descendant, and he's going to sacrifice that kid. But in the, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us 
that Abraham was willing to kill his own son because the promise was so strong and God is so faithful that even if I kill my son, God will raise him from the dead if he has to to make this promise come to pass. And so Mordecai is so confident, not in himself, not in Esther, but so confident in the Lord that the promise will happen. That if you don't say something, someone will. It's funny here, even the people who don't believe in God, they're going through all this with, with Queen Esther and Xerxes and Mordecai and Haman. And, and Haman's trying to accomplish this death of the people. But you got this God who's fighting against him, and he's not going to let it happen. And finally, Haman's so frustrated with everything that's going on, he's trying to kill this guy, and now Xerxes is honoring this guy. And he's so frustrated, he goes home to his wife, and he goes home to his family and his, his advisors, and he's like, man, this stuff is going on. And it says right here, listen, in chapter 6, verse 13, check it out. When Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends what had happened, how he had tried to kill the guy, but now the king is honoring this guy, his wise advisors, these guys are actually wise, watch what they say. And his wife said this, Since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you, is of Jewish birth, you will never succeed in your plans against him. Right? They got it. It will be, listen, I love this, it will be fatal to continue to oppose him. They're like, this guy's Jewish, man. You, he's got this God on his side. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to stop it, right? Remember the video that our God is unstoppable. He promised Abraham, it came to pass. He promised Moses, it came to pass. And so here, the same thing. He's, he's making it all happen because he made a promise that this would, this would happen and he's not going to let Israel die. So even the people there, they got it. You can't stop this God. And so you want to know why you could say these things with confidence? Because you're here. It's true. Look, you're the nation that he promised. He said to Abraham way back when, I'm going to create a nation. And here it is. Thousands of years later, thousands of miles away, now there's you right here and two and a half billion of us spreading across the earth. You're part of that promised nation. And it's because Mordecai displayed great character that the promise lived. And it was because Esther chose to be bold and put herself into the, this, this is crazy situation by approaching the king. And because of that, the promise stands and you're here. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful to do what he says. Egypt and the Pharaoh couldn't stop it. Persia and Xerxes and Haman couldn't stop it. God is not named in this book, but he is certainly, certainly noticed. God's plans will come to pass no matter what. Check out these two verses as we get ready to be done. Job 42.2 says this, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And again, Isaiah 14.27, similar, but look what it says. The Lord of hosts has spoken who can change his plans when his hand is raised who can stop him so hopefully i've proclaimed god's word to you with some clarity hopefully i've explained to you what's going on here with some clarity but now it's application time for you so you have to ask yourself a question and it's the same question that Mordecai asked Esther. And it's this. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this? God placed her there in that position, in that time, to accomplish his plan. That's just what God does, right? In Matthew 16, 18, God, Jesus Christ says, I'm going to build my church. And in Ephesians 4, he tells us how he's going to build it. He said he places us together perfectly. And as each of us does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. And the whole church, which is his kingdom, is healthy, growing, and full of love. That's what he does. And so the question you have to ask is, what do you hear a revolution 
Leesburg, Florida, 2018. Like, why, why are you here? What are you here for? If, if, if you believe God's word that he's building his kingdom, he's building his church, and that he placed you here perfectly, that you didn't really choose to come to this church, he chose for you to come to this church, and he wants you to do something that will help build up his kingdom, why here? Why now? And why me? Start thinking about this. What, what are my gifts? What are my talents? What, what gifting and talent that he has given me? What, what has he done for me that I can use to help build his kingdom? What are the opportunities that I have before me? What are my resources that I have at my disposal? Who are my neighbors? Who are my coworkers? Who are my classmates? How can I serve God and his plan just like Esther? All of you have been placed here for a reason, and it's not just to come in here and listen to one person talk. This church will be as beautiful as you make it. I'm doing my part right now, and the question is, what part do you have in this church to make it as beautiful as God would want it to be? On Sunday, May 20th at 1 o'clock, when we get done with the service, I'm going to have lunch served here. We're going to do a thing called Servolution. We did it before. We're going to do it again if you're not familiar with what that is. Here's, here's what this is. Revolution, the name of our church, is a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. The status quo of the church in America is, what kind of church is it? What do they have for me? Oh, they have everything I want? I'll go there. But the status quo shift for us is, I want you guys to be thinking, what can I do for the church rather, rather than what can the church do for me? And so, if you've all been placed here, but you don't really know what you're supposed to be doing, maybe it's because you don't know that there's opportunities. And so on this day that's up there on the screen, you're going to know everything that's available at this church to do, that we know of, that we have been able to think of, we're going to lay it all out before you, and you can see, okay, maybe I can do this, and maybe I can do that. And let me just tell you this. When you read them, you're going to go, well, I'm not really good at that. Just step into it. Just step into it. Listen, the Jordan River opens when the feet go in. You've got to step into some things, even if you feel like maybe it's not for you. But maybe somehow you'll see that in the doing, you'll be blessed. Where can I plug in to serve just like Esther did in this place, at this time, in this church? Where can I take a risk? How can Christ in me help build his church so I can be part of God fulfilling this promise to Abraham? That's what's happening. And that's why you're here. God builds his church upon the ones who are already in it. And you're in it. So it's time for us all to stop being consumers and be participants in what's going on in the church so they can be all that God would want it to be. Amen? All right. So really, that's the story. That's the story of Esther. The story of Esther is not good guys against bad guys and the good guys win. That's Hollywood. The story of Esther is that Haman wanted to kill every single Jew, but God is so faithful that somehow he worked through Mordecai and Esther to, 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 to thwart that plan so that the Jewish people could live so you could be here today because that's a promise he made to Abraham 1,600 years before. God is faithful. Now, I want to sing one more time. One more song, you get to sing. And um, I just want you to be thinking about I want you to be thinking about this before we sing that song. I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to um, do a little work between you and the Lord and just start asking him this, like, why me? Why here? Why now? What can I do? Because, look, at this church and this community will never be all it could be until God's people plug in and do all that he would want them to do. God does have a plan for our church. He has a plan for our community. And it's on you guys. You're his people, right? You're his people. So be thinking about that. And then in just a moment, that last song will come on. And you can sing to the king. Amen? All right. So let's just pray. Father, I, uh, I thank you for uh, this message. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for um, opening up my eyes to the truth of this story. 
that it's not just good guys against bad guys like Hollywood, Hollywood would uh, portray. Lord, it's the story of your faithfulness. You have made a promise, and you cannot deny yourself. And you are unwilling to let your reputation be tarnished. And so, Lord, we understand that you're going to make things happen because your namesake is at stake. Your name will never equate to failure. And because of that, we can rest on the truth that when you make a promise, it's going to come to pass. Now, Lord, we understand that if it's not us that steps in and begins to roll up our sleeves and work with you, that someone else will. But, Lord, we don't want to be, we don't want to be those people that, 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 that ruin that blessing. We want that blessing. So, Lord, speak to us, Lord, over these next days and weeks and, and help us to understand our gifting and our talents and what you would want us to do to plug into your church and to see the promise that you've made to Abraham come to pass in our generation on our watch while we're here. We want to see you exalted in, in a great way. We want to see people come to you and worship you and serve you and love you. We want to see that in great numbers. We want to see the whole, we want to see just as you as you desire in your word where it says that it is your desire that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. And Lord, that's our heart too. We want to see that, Lord. But I understand and we all do that it rests upon us. That it's your power at work within us where you can do immeasurably more than we could ask or think. So inspire us, Lord. Inspire us and lead us in the way that we should go as a church. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name.